I want to start out by getting a little bit of background about, uh, you know, you said you grew up in Spokane, mm -hmm. so uh, what life was like when you were a kid? And well, life when I was a kid is a lot different than life for kids today. I mean, little boys were tough little boys. My time is, it, it was, you, you, little boys were, were very independent back then. They, they, they weren't you know, covered by their parents, you know, 24 seven, they, they did their own things. So let me, and when I say their own thing, uh, we had a game that we used to play called King of the Porch when I was 10 years old. And say six boys, you know, team up three, three here. Anything goes. I mean, we're all friends hit each other in the face, it, it doesn't, I mean, I'd come home, black eyes, you know, blood on my shirt, my shirt ripped, like a real fight. We were just playing. We used to have slingshot fights. You know, we'd wear a football helmet or something, you know. <laughs> and I mean, we were brought up tough little boys, and which prepared us for life. We, they, you had the kid world, and then you had the parent world, and. Unless it was something very important, the two rarely connected. When you were with your friends, your uh, little kids, uh, your parents really didn't get involved uh, with anything. They didn't get involved with the soccer game. Well, we didn't even have soccer. I didn't even know what soccer was when I was a little boy. Football, baseball, that's what I did. Okay, and we used to play foot, you know, tackle football without you know any any. Any, any pads or anything else. We'd go up to the park and play tackle football when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. So it was a different world than it is now. I always wanted to be a soldier. I think a lot of it, uh, even when I was a little kid, I think a lot of it came from my uncle, uh, Bob, I'm namesake, and uh, he, he was in the paratroops in World War II. So. So he would tell you stories about his experiences? Something or, in the, you know, being, a, and I looked up to my Uncle Bob, I mean, he was my guy when I was a little kid, and uh, so I always had that in the back. I, I wanted to go into the Marines, and I was going into the Marines, and uh, I admitted to having some juvenile issues, so at, at that time, uh, this is in 1963, uh, they, they had to have you signed off by some person that said you were okay to go to marine boot camp uh, but that guy was not there at the testing station at the time he wouldn't be back until the following week so because i was packed ready to go i'd passed my written test my physical everything else i was passed except i admitted i didn't have it a, a, a rap sheet or anything but i admitted to getting in trouble and going to juvenile hall and just by my admission at that time I had to have this guy talk to me and, and, and sign me off. Well, at that point in time, I, I wanted to go in. So that very day, I, I walked down past the recruiting station in Spokane, which was just adjacent at that time from the Davenport Hotel at that time. It was right on the street. And uh, I walked by and I, I saw this poster that said, you know, be a paratrooper. And I'm, I'm gazing at it, thinking about my uncle, and uh, the recruiter came out and uh, got me back in the office, and I told him my sad story down at the testing station. He said, well, wait a minute, you, you passed all your tests and everything? And he, he said, then now they want you to wait till next week so you can go to boot camp? And yeah, and uh, he said, what's your name again? So he called down to AFES, the testing, they, they call it MEPS or METS or something nowadays, but at that time it's AFES, Armed Forces Examination and Enlistment Center, or station. So uh, he got all my scores and everything, and that's when he said, what do you want to go in the Marines for? And I said, well, he says, you want to be in a fighting unit, right? And I said, well, yeah. He says, how would you like to be a cook? And I said, no, I don't want to be a cook. And he said, the Marines are only promising you one thing. And he said, the Marines, they might make you a cook. You, hell, you might be cleaning out toilet bowls. You know, they're not guaranteeing you anything. You want infantry, right? Yeah. He said, and then he told me about being in the paratroops and uh, the, the jump pay and all of that was very, very appealing to me at the time. So, uh, and, he, and he said, the great uniforms, because you get your jump boots and the special thing on your hat that shows you're a paratrooper and you're... You're drawing, in 1963 drawing, at that time, jump pay was $55 extra. A private's pay in the military at that time, coming in, and that's all branches, 
78 bucks a month at that time. So $55, that's a huge jump in your pay. So, and he said, you want, and I'll have you on, on your way to boot camp tomorrow afternoon. So he had me meet him down at the AFES, the testing station the next day. And he says, you're going to hang around here all day this afternoon. You're going to swear in. He says, you don't have to take any tests, no physical. You're, we're just transferring all your paperwork from the Marines to the Army. And he says, and they're guaranteeing me in writing airborne infantry. Okay, in writing. He says, this is, this is a, now you, you don't make it through jump school. He says, that's not the Army's fault. That's, that's on you. But I am guaranteeing you infantry and you're going to airborne if you get through jump school then you'll also be in the paratroops, okay? So that's what happened. So it changed my entire course of life. Uh, so I might have ended up in the Marines for 20 years. I don't know. And uh, so you're enlisting in 1963. Are you aware of what's going on in Vietnam at that time? Absolutely not. No. I turned, you know, I just turned 17. I mean, I'm like, like a week or so after I turned 17. I'm a kid. I have no I, the, the Vietnam War or anything like that. That I never. Who watched the news back then at 16, 17 years old? I don't care. So I wanted to be in the paratroopers. I had no idea that we are on the precipice of, of war. I had no idea. So uh, I assume they they sent you to boot camp and then. Uh... Well, my I, my book. I I'll show it to you when we, when you hear. I'll let you take a peek at. Yeah. It. Perfect. And uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I went on to boot camp and uh, uh, in the jump school, and uh, then uh, I, I, when I got to jump school, I hurt my foot. You had to make five qualifying jumps to graduate, get your wings. And on my third jump, I hurt my ankle because I, I froze up. I, I did I, I did a one-legged landing. Anyway, it, it, it set me back about three four weeks. So they had to put in like a soft cast. I had crutches and I had to, you know, pull KP and stuff until my foot was back so I could make my last two qualifying jumps. Well, during that time, uh, uh, they, gave, they told you where you were going and gave you your travel pay in jump week when you were making your jumps because all the training was over. You were just making your jumps and getting ready to go. And I was supposed to go to the newly formed 173rd Airborne in Okinawa, which was in Okinawa at the time. It hadn't gone to Vietnam yet. This because this, I finally graduated like January of '64. I should have graduated earlier, but uh, it's the foot thing. So I got recycled, and I went to a new company about three, four weeks later, and I made my last two qualifying jumps, and. Uh, I'm, we're standing out in the formation outside because we just graduated and got our jump wings. And a, a kid next to me said, hey, they got everybody's postings, you know, in the day room, everybody where everybody's going. Because they'd already given me travel pay to Oakland Army Terminal in California. And I'm at Fort Benning, Georgia here for jump school. And uh, everybody that's going far east goes through Oakland Army Terminal. So they had already given me travel pay from Georgia to Oakland. Uh, because I'm going on to the 173rd in Okinawa. So, uh, and that was, you know, I think it was like 80 bucks, but that was a lot of money back then, you know, for my plane ticket and everything. So, a uh, kid says to me, he says, hey, they got it all posted in the day room. I said, I already know where I'm going. I'm going to the 173rd in Okinawa. And he says, man, if I was you, I'd check again. <laughs> I went in there and looked, and I have, sure enough, they had my name signed to the 11th Air Assault Division in parentheses test. It was a test division of air mobility. The, it, was, it was testing helicopter warfare. They had one airborne paratroop battalion in that division, which where I would be assigned to. I had no idea, but the destination, 11th Air Assault Division, Fort Benning, Georgia. So instead of taking a jet plane across the world to Okinawa, I got to take an army shuttle bus across Fort Benning. <laughs> and for a 17-year-old kid who had all these ex expectations of going there and the Japanese girls in Okinawa and all of that, I'm still at Fort Benning. So that was a, a bummer. The upside of that was 
I spent that, that, that travel pay they gave me and I never ever, they never ever took it back. Never had to pay it back. So I thought, in the Army, they, they get sometimes called an NPD. It's called a no pay due <laughs> when, when they paid you. And back in those days, they paid you once a month. And you had to go formally report to the company commander and all of that, and they paid you in cash. You know? So uh, that never, I never had to pay that back. So that was nice. So the 11th Air Assault Division, became in 19 they had the big ceremony they brought the colors of the first cavalry division from korea in june of 1965 to fort benning at which time we became the first air cav division they expanded our battalion we had one battalion you have three brigades in a division and three battalions within each brigade okay so there was only one battalion because we were in first brigade and the other two battalions were not, they were just air assault, they weren't airborne infantry. So they extended the other two battalions and made them airborne infantry as well. So the first brigade of June 65 till September of 66 was, was an airborne parachute, parachute infantry regiment until September of 66. And then they, they took the jump uh, status away from them in September of 66. Uh, so, so then Johnson uh, uh, announced that he is, in July 1965, that uh, he is now sending the, Air, the new Air Mobile Division, 1st Cavalry, to Vietnam, as we got the word. And uh, in August, uh, we, we left in troop ships out of Savannah, Georgia, 30 days through the canal and to Vietnam. And uh, how are you feeling about that? Because you're so young and you've been doing all this training. Or you, What's your feeling about going overseas? Oh, it was an ex excitement of my book. You know, I mean, I was, uh, this was uh, the great adventure. And I mean, I, I, was, uh, I was 18. And uh, this was, oh, this, this is something I've, all my life, I always knew that I was going to be in a war. I used to tell my mom that when I was t 9, 10 years old. And how do you know that? Well, I just knew. And I knew this was kind of like destiny. But, and I, I, most of the guys my age were all gung-ho. They were, they were ready. You know. Some of the older sergeants, my squad leader and my platoon sergeant, and another squad leader, all of those guys were Korean War veterans themselves. They, they, they weren't as jubilant as, as the, the, the young kids were. My guys, us, we were kids. And uh, they knew what was coming and they weren't happy. I'll never forget, we were down in the day room in, my, in the barracks at Fort Benning in our, my unit at the 11th Air Assault, and uh, Johnson was on TV, and everybody knew he was making an announcement, the old black and white TV, and uh, he said, I am now sending the Air Mobile Division to Vietnam, and everybody started talking and yelling and all this going on, and my platoon sergeant, Sergeant Dixon, was standing right next to me, I said, Sarge, what does that mean? What's this mean? And he just looked at me and says, we're going to war, Martin. We are going to war. And he was very solemn about it, and he walked away. I'll never forget that. So can you tell me, uh, so you, you leave and you go through the Panama Canal, and uh, uh, what was that process? Where did you go in Vietnam? And Chile? Well, we landed, uh, we landed in the night in a place called Quinh Yan, Vietnam. And uh, it's a big port city on, on the coast of Vietnam there. And it was night, and everybody gets night, because you can hear off in the distance airstrikes and way on land, because we're still on the ship. And you can hear the artillery and bombs and stuff way off in the distance. And everybody went. So then we got the word, because ours was the original paratroop battalion. You know, they made the, the other ones were new paratroop battalions, but the old, our battalion was the new, or the old one. So we got the honor of disembarking first in the morning at O-Dark 30 onto the landing craft off the sides of the ship. So we went down like Marines. And nobody knew it. We got live ammo that night. We were issued live ammunition, uh, everything. You know, we got down in the uh, LSTs or whatever. And the, the, the real high, uh, the, so you really couldn't see over the sides. So we went around and around until the sun started coming up in the water. 
and we th we thought we were gonna make like a like a hostile beach landing or something. <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> so here we go. Sun's up. It's about 6:30, 7 o'clock in the morning, and the, the LST hits the beach, and the ramp comes down, <laughs> and you got you got little kids running back and forth trying to sell Coca-Cola. You got Mama Son with the betel nut blackened teeth, chop chop. Uh, you know, uh, you want a girlfriend? I mean, it's, it's going wrong right on the beach as we landed. You know, this, this is not exactly Iwo Jima here. <laughs> and I, and I said, oh man, <laughs> what is this? So then, uh, so they got us formed up. Our company got formed up. We had to march about a mile or so to the airstrip uh, there in Quinyan. And uh, so, and it was hot. That was the first thing. Everybody's got all their gear and their weapons and their packs and everything on. So, wow, this is kicking my ass because we're not used to this kind of heat. So we got to the airstrip, and while we're waiting for choppers to come in and take us to uh, Anke, which would be our new base camp, uh, it's in the center high in the mountains of the Central Highlands. Uh, uh, we were at the base there, at the air base there in uh, Quinyan. And uh, while we're doing that, we got held up because the 101st Airborne was on a, a, a major battle, major firefight not too far right where we were at in that same province, that same area. And it was the first time in my life I ever saw a dead person, ever. I'd never seen a dead person before. And they were bringing in the ambulances were there on the airstrip and they're, they're getting them off the choppers, the wounded and everything. And there was this one kid I'll never forget. And they were carrying, I had him on a stretcher, but uh, his face was ashen and he had one eye closed and the other one staring off by itself and he ashen and white looking and under behind his head on the canvas of the stretcher was a big puddle of blood under his head. And uh, uh, I remember looking, he was about my age, about 18, 19. And I remember just staring at him and my buddy was, was standing there he said, and I remember he looked at me and says, man, he says, I guess this shit's for real, isn't it? And I said, yeah, man. I said, you ever seen a dead guy before? He said, no. He says, I've gone to a funeral. I see somebody, I saw somebody in a casket once. I hadn't even seen that. I'd never been to a, a wake. It was the first person I ever saw dead, and he was my age. So that was kind of a, an eye-opener for me. And then we were flown to Anke. Uh, we got starting to set up our base camp. And uh, a month after that, in October, because we got we landed there like September 15th, 65, because we left around mid-August of 65. So it was 30 days on the ship. And uh, a month later, uh, things were heating up, and uh, we didn't know. We they had a song. They and on K at the base camp, they, they had what they called the Green Tracer Line. What it was, was, it was because we didn't, they didn't have any fortifications set up. We had to dig foxholes, and they were trying to get all the jungle away from the perimeter, you know, to keep Charlie at bay. So rifle companies, infantry companies would come up, and they, during the day, they'd be cutting down bushes and stuff, and at night, they'd be digging, they dug in foxholes and stuff, because we really hadn't, because Anke later became fortified. You know, they had cement bunkers and all this stuff, but we got there, it was just jungle and mountains. So, and, and Charlie was, we, it, when we were out cutting down bush and all that during the day, we were finding aiming sticks that Charlie had set in there at, at night, aiming sticks on our positions and uh, uh, so that was going on so we, we were doing that for a couple few weeks and then got the word we got to go back down to where, where all our tents and everything were at and we were going, ready to go on our first operation operation shiny bayonet October 1965 and uh, on 10th of October, um, we, uh, we, we were, the, the object was there was another battalion, we were supposed to act as a blocking force, as I recall. See that general right there with the four stars? Mm -hmm. That's uh, General Shoemaker. Uh, 
But in 1965, in October of 1965, General Shoemaker was my battalion commander. He was a lieutenant colonel then. He became a four-star general. That's me on the other side, and that, I was a cop in Chicago then, and that's my partner who, who was a gunship pilot in Vietnam, Don. So we became General Shoemaker's, that's 1986 Chicago, uh, the Welcome Home Parade in Chicago to Vietnam vets. And uh, that's, that's a story in itself because General Shoemaker didn't know what was happening. And General Shoemaker and, well, Morley Safer. You ever heard of Morley Safer? 60 Minutes? The name's familiar, yeah. Okay. Well, he's in this whole thing. Uh, basically, uh, they, it's a, I, I'll get to that. <laughs> but Morley Safer was with Colonel Shoemaker at the time something happened. And uh, so, October 10th, 1965, we uh, made the assault. We were supposed to be a blocking force. Well, another battalion pushed uh, enemy regimental size towards us. Well, somehow things got screwed up and we were no longer the blocking force. We became the attacking force. And uh, we were coming into the LZ in the valley uh, at the base of a mountain range called the Suikai Mountains. And uh, we started taking enemy fire, green tracers coming up, hitting the choppers. And remember the door gunner took it uh, right in the neck or the head. And uh, he was like, he was in his harness in the door and you know, blood all over the place. And he was just like suspended like a marionette in the harness. That was the first time I saw someone killed. I'd never seen a person killed before. And then my squad leader, Sergeant Chambly, he's, he's saying, we get close to that LZ, he says, we're on ass in this chopper now, because we, you could hear the bullets are hitting the, the chopper. So we got off the chopper, and for the next three days, uh, it was some pretty serious fighting. And uh, it's, uh, well, that's where I, I, I earned the Silver Star, uh, in a creek bed, which involved Colonel Shoemaker and Morley Safer as well. And uh, yeah, could you recount that? How what how that came about? Yeah. Uh, okay. So we've been fighting, and as soon as we advanced, we were making contact every day. We were, we were in a fight. And on October twelfth, I can in fact I can show you something when you're all done. Mm -hmm. On October twelfth, uh, our because we'd been making one day we we'd make a frontal. There was a. It's the valley, and the valley like closed in. It, it bottlenecked at a certain location. So in the valley itself, we were making contact every day, but uh, we, de we they determined where the enemy were dug in, and these, these foothill foot foothills, uh, where a stream bed went through the valley, right where it bottlenecked. And they decided to keep A A and B. I was in B Company, uh, A and B Company to go down the stream bed. B Company was on. Uh, lead. Uh, my platoon was on lead for B Company, and my squad was the point, and I was the point man. October 12, 1965. And we were going down to flank and get ourselves into a pos an attacking position. Well, unfortunately, the, Charlie had uh, anticipated this move, and he had set up a 50 caliber machine gun and mach all kinds of machine gun positions in that quick ravine where it bottlenecks in there. We were literally fish in a, in a bottle. And uh, my squad came around this bend right here, which kind of like, well, the rest, you got the rest of, you got two companies behind you. That, back then, that's you know, like 300 guys, you know. But uh, my squad comprised of 11 men then, 11 guys. And uh, the 50 opened up, uh, took the guys, there was two, there were my, my squad on this side and weapons platoon squad, a guy named Fred Toynes was a point man on my left flank. He was about 20 feet or so away from me, was on the other side of the stream bed. And I'll never forget Toynes, he had stopped and I was like, I'm like this and he's about, and Toynes is about like that. And he looked back at me, I don't, I don't know what. And as soon as he looked at me and turned back, the 50 opened up and it took Toynes in the, in the head and you know, it popped his right through his helmet. It's a 50 caliber. And then Sergeant Horn 
came up behind him trying to help Toynes. He didn't know Toynes was dead before he hit the ground. And uh, Sergeant Horn took it uh, in uh, both legs and, and, then, and then he took it in the, in the chest. And uh, that's when all hell br really broke loose. They were all over the place. And uh, the company knew that th they were in deep, deep shit. Because the dinks were running along the bank, throwing grenades down on us, shooting, and we were, we were fishing a barrel. And in the first 30 seconds of the fight, the major, uh, um, uh, at least half of the squad was down. At least half. That's in the first 30 seconds, including Sergeant Chambly, my squad leader. Sergeant Chambly, he got hit. He, he, got, he was really shot up. And... Uh, Everybody's yelling and screaming, and nobody knows what's going on. You know, I don't know what the hell is going on. And uh, I, my confidence was in Sergeant Chambly. And then Meyer, this kid Meyer, was screaming, he's dead, he's dead. And Chambly, he's, bare, he's breathing. And he, he said, I'm not dead. you got to get your fucking act together. And he started yelling at us. And he, he was shot through the chest, through both legs. And uh, so that's going on. And the company is pulling back because we're over here and the company's here and they got to get out of that situation or they're going to all die. And uh, so basically we were left by ourselves. And half the squad's down now, shot up. Chambly's dying. Kid named uh, uh, Romano from Lombard, Illinois, which we lived right by Lombard, Illinois. It's a Chicago suburb. We lived right next door to Lombard. But I, I didn't know Romano. I didn't know where Lombard, Illinois was at that time. <laughs> but Romano was killed. And uh, almost everybody in the squad was hit. And so I organized guys. Guys were, were badly hit. One guy that wasn't hit, get them and take them out, out. You know, and start following the company, that, which withdrawing. Get them out of there the best we can, because these guys have got to get out of their shot bad. And... Uh, at the last, it was myself, uh, uh, Tony Lujan, uh, Smitty, and Sergeant Chambly, and Meyer. My, Meyer was in fighting a few minutes later. Meyer got hit in the, near the spinal area, and Meyer's going crazy screaming. And he's like 10, 12 feet away from where I got Smitty, Chambly. Well, Lujan isn't hit yet. And uh, I'm trying to get everybody organized and out of there. Uh, then Sergeant Marshall, Sergeant Marshall was a team leader. Squad leader Sergeant Chambers was like an E6, team leader was an E5. And Sergeant Marshall was, was my team leader. And he, and he yelled at that, Martin, you and Smitty come up here, he's on the embankment. He says, I think they're running across because in that bottleneck, you had like about 100 yards of rice paddy. And then that's where all these hills and stuff were. He had hills and hills and to our left and everything. But they were coming across the rice paddy. Bunch, bunch of bad guys were. And then Sergeant Marshall called for Smitty and I to, to get up there and, and put suppressing fire down. So we both got up, and sure enough, uh, they were coming out of the, the tree line, coming out towards us. So we opened up, hit a bunch of them, and then they drug their wounded back into the tree line. So as we started scuttling back down the creek bed into the ravine where the rest of the squad was at, Sergeant Chambly was hit bad. Uh, Sergeant Marshall, automatic fire coming from who knows where, took Sergeant Marshall on the shoulder and it shot his ear off. Just, just a stump of an ear there. And he was like in shock and, he, and his arm was just like that. And, and I asked Sergeant Marshall, if he, 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 did he understand me? Did he know what's going on? He was like in a daze. And I said, can you just walk down that way? And I, and I was pointing towards where the companies were withdrawn back to. And he nodded his head, so he stumbled off in that direction. So me and Smitty now, we went back down in there. So we're working on Chambly and another guy. Uh, Tifton, my, my best friend Price took Tifton. Uh, Tifton was shot in the belly. I'll never forget before Price took him out. Tifton looked at him and he, he says, We're fucked, R.O. <laughs> <laughs> so it was me, Smitty now, and Tony Lujan was on his hands and knees. We are working on Sergeant Chambly. Lujan stood up on his knees, because I'm, I'm, like I'm here, Chambly is laying here. I'm trying to get a, because um, he's got two holes sucking chest wounds in his chest. 
And um, so I've got his shirt off. I'm taking an ace bandage and I'm tying and tight. But what I did, because they taught us this in basic training, uh, I had plastic from the, the battery for the, for, the, for the radio. So I took the plastic, I put it on the sucking chest wound and then wrapped the bandage around it. So you put pressure on there because he's pumping blood out. He's the sucking chest wound. Well, it's internal, in fact. And uh, so I did that. Just about the time I was doing that, Tony Lujan got up on his knees to do something, just got on his knees, and fire came right down through the creek bed, uh, got, went right through his, his back and out through here. You, know, you could almost see it because he was only that far from me. And, and, he, went, and he had this look of shock, and, and, he, and he, like in a nanosecond, he looked at me, like confused, and then next second, uh, went right through his mouth and through his jaw. Another round did. And then he, then he's down on all fours and he got blood coming out of his mouth. And I mean, he's in shock. And, and I yelled at him and asked him if he understood, you know, can you crawl? Can you crawl on your own? And he's nodding his head. And I said, just keep following the company, Tony. I, there's no, we don't have anybody that can get you out of here right now. Uh, because he started crawling down the creek bed and so uh, I'm running out of ammo. And they didn't give us, this was our first go in combat in Vietnam. And, and see, we used to train in, at Fort Benning with seven magazines, okay? That's all we had on this battle. So I saw a, drop, a machine gun that was dropped in the withdrawal. So I went and got the machine gun and it had like 30 or 40 rounds still dangling. It was in the breach. And so I said, okay, at least I have this. Then I saw movement down in the creek bed coming towards us, not from the good guys. I said, what the hell? And there were actually two soul uh, bad guys who were like in the water walking down, had AK-47s. They were walking towards us in the stream, but they didn't see me. So I got the machine gun and uh, crawled around in a place that put me in an advantage and cover me so they wouldn't see me. So they were only like 15 feet away from me when they came into the open for me. And then a thought hit me just before I pulled the trigger. What if this machine gun had uh, malfunctioned? <laughs> I said, man, I am totally screwed if that's the case. <laughs> but it didn't. And, uh, I used to, I, I shot every round out of them uh, on the on the belt. Kept, they were they were down in the first few rounds, and I, to this day I wonder if they spotted me before they died or not. I don't have any idea, none. So then I go back, machine gun. All the bullets are gone. I only have like Smitty's rifle, and that's because Smitty was still okay. So I go back to to help Smitty with Chambly. Everybody else is gone. Romano's dead, uh, and everybody else, the other guys had taken the wounded out. So it's just me now, Smitty, and Sergeant Chambly. And so I went back, so we're working on Sergeant Chambly, and then I noticed his leg was, the bone, he, he got hit in the leg with a 50, and the bone was, it was sticking out. I didn't even notice until I crawled back there after I killed the two. And, uh, uh, I said, oh my God, you know, how do I, do I got to make a splint? And we were just thinking about that. Dink ran up on the edge of the creek bed because it was like late in the afternoon. It started, it looked like the sun was, he, 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 for a nanosecond, he was silhouetted right there for a second. He had an AK-47 and he just shot down. He hit Smitty right in the gut. Smitty fell back into the water because we're right on the water's edge. And I pulled him back up and he, He's more pissed off than he is scared, and I keep telling him it's going to be okay. It's been okay. He says, "Look, Martin, does it look like it's going to be okay to you?" <laughs> he said, "Give me some water. I want water." And they keep telling us, "Don't, especially stomach wounds. You don't give water." And he says, "I don't give a shit. I don't. I need one." So I'm giving him cups of, uh, of my hand, and and trying to satisfy him. Chamberlain still mumbling and giving me orders. And, I, and I'm, I'm looking now on that, that, that because it's, it's about 20 feet or so up 
on the, on the embankment. And I hope another one doesn't come down there because they already saw us. Sure enough, you know, I, another one come running down over there. And this time I fired and he, and he fell down into the bushes in, in the encrypment. And then I heard movement in the bushes again. So I crawled over there with uh, Smitty's M16. And uh, he was laying there and he, it looked like he was trying to get to his belt, the, the NVA. You know, trying to get to his belt or something. And I, I just put the, the barrel of the rifle to his head and pulled it, killed him. And uh, so then I crawled back down to Smitty and I gave Sergeant Chamberlain a briefing of what's going on. And uh, he says, you gotta shut Meyer up. Because Meyer's going back and forth and yelling and screaming. And, and he's like, he's like 12 feet away or so. And I really don't want to stand up. I'm telling you now, I'm, I'm like a snake down there. <laughs> and that's the way I want to keep it. <laughs> and he says, you got to shut Meyer up. He's going to bring them all down on us. So I crawled over to Meyer. And I, 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 I can't remember Meyer's first name, but uh, I said, Gee, man, you, you got to be quiet, man. You got to, oh, God, don't leave me. Don't. I said, nobody's going to leave you, man. Nobody's going to leave you. Just just be, just be, stop yelling and shit. I'm going to bring you over with Smitty and Chamberlain is that. I, I, now I'm going to have to get up and crouch down and I'm going to have to drag you. I don't want you screaming when I'm dragging you. He said, well, just look at my back. Look at my back, man. Is there anything? And I, I kind of pushed it on his back. And, you know, man, it was all chopped up. And, oh, man. And he said, how does it look? How does it look? And I, I said, well, you're not going to be running a marathon for a while. So I said, just bite, the, just bite hard, man. I said, I'm going to pull you over to where the rest of the other guys are at. Just don't, because I, I'm, I don't, I'm going to be a target. So he didn't. He kept his, he clenched his jaw, and I just drug him backwards to where Smitty and, and Chamberlain was at, and uh, got them together. And I told Chamberlain it was starting to get, starting to get dark, twilight. And I, I, I said, Sarge, I've been thinking about maybe, you know, best thing to do is wait here until dark get you guys covered up and I can get it, I can hightail it back down there and tell them we got three guys here. So you had Meyer, you had Smitty, and you got Chamberlain. None of them can walk now. You know, they're all shot up. And he says, well, Martin, for the first time, I, he says, it looks like we were thinking the same on the right track. <laughs> so we're waiting for, we're waiting for it to get really dark. And then bef just before that, then I heard the bushes moving, but from the other direction. And then I, I thought, the dinks had surrounded me. And I took, I had Smitty's M16, I had like two rounds in it left, and uh, I put a bayonet on it. And uh, it's funny, just an odd feeling. The nerve, this fright and everything just left suddenly. And I was thinking about my mom and thinking, I hope this is not you know, hurt her too much. And right about that time, I heard in English, who's back here? Oh. <laughs> it was our chaplain, battalion chaplain. His last name is Lord, Billy Lord. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> yeah. Chaplain Billy Lord. And he, 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 uh, uh put together a group of a few guys from A Company and B Company, about six, seven guys. And because Price, who had taken Tifton out, who had the gut, gut, gut shot, uh, I'd gone back and he said, Martin's up there alone with the rest of the squad. Everybody's down. And it, Price told him what's going on. And, and that's when Chaplain Lord went ahead and, and got the other guys and they came up to find us. And uh, it's a scary place. So, okay. So I wanted to kiss everybody. So we then we started Chamberlain. Chamberlain was a big man, uh, about six foot one. I'd say about 190 pounds, and you know, black guy. And uh, uh, carrying him was so hard from the water and all the blood. Every time I I, I tried to have Price or yeah, because Price came back with the team that came and get us. He showed him where we were at. So Price and I. Price would try to put him on my shoulder, he'd just slide down. And we're, we're having a hell of a time carrying him, and he's in a lot of pain. I, I give it to this guy, he didn't scream, he didn't yell, and you know, the bone sticking out? You know, I mean, I'd have been screaming for my mommy, but uh, he, he, he just, he, all he'd do is just go, oh Lord, oh Lord, that's all he did. 
And uh, so Price and I, I took Sergeant Chambly under his arms and Price grabbed his legs. And we're going down the stream and we're bumping on rocks and dropping him and picking him back up. It, it had to be excruciating. Meyer, Meyer was being carried, he was screaming. And then Smitty was able, had two guys on Smitty and they both held him up and Smitty was able, they, he was able to like half walk. And, and he didn't, he wasn't yelling or anything, he, but you know, he, you know, he was in kind of shock. So we moved up the creek bed away from that position because Chaplain Lord told me that, uh, he says, they're bringing airstrikes and napalm in right here, right now, in the next, and real, real quick, we got to get out of here. So we started going heading down a stream bed. We had our, our wounded with us. We had to leave the dead back. Toyne, Sergeant Horn, Romano, they're, they're all left there because we, we couldn't carry them. Uh, we had to get out of there like right away and uh, uh we're moving up then we heard ak fire on the embankment again and uh now it's starting to get the sun is almost set down all the way so uh we put i put uh, price and i put chambly down and uh somebody gave i i got i grabbed an m16 from one of the guys that came up and i ran up on the embankment and about 20 30 feet down there were two dinks throwing grenades down in, 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 into the creek. And one guy had an AK, and uh, so they, they didn't even notice me. So I came running up, and on semi-fire, I just started shooting. <laughs> and uh, I, I got them, and uh, it's dark. I can't even see, because it's all jungle and stuff down there. I, got, I said, who's down here? And he said, it's Colonel Shoemaker. <laughs> What the hell is a colonel doing this far up? He had gone all the way up to direct airstrikes and stuff. The colonel did on his own and, uh, and artillery. And he, so he was way up there, which blew my mind. So, uh, and a, there was a chopper crash not too far. Well, that's the chopper that uh, uh, Morley Safer was in. So, and he ran to the cover of, of the creek bed, okay? And so he, he linked up with Colonel Shoemaker and Colonel Shoemaker's RTO, radio telephone operator, his, his radio guy. And so they were both down there and the dinks were throwing grenades down on the ones that I neutralized. And, uh, and he said, who are you? And I said, Pri the colonel busted me on the ship. Everybody got on the ship in Savannah as if you were a private E2, you, you're a private E3 now, PFC E3 now, okay? Everybody. Because th th this is long before Velcro became a, a thing in the army. They said, "Martin, you need you need Velcro stripes." Because I got busted like three times back at Fort Benning. I was E three one day, I'm E two the next. So if you read my Silver Star orders, I was an E two. I was busted on the ship by Colonel Shoemaker, <laughs> that guy. <laughs> and he goes, "Martin," he says. He said, he said what, what's the status? And I told him we're bringing wounded down from the creek. And he said, what? Wait a minute. Aren't you the son of a bitch that I had to bust on the ship? <laughs> yes, sir. He said, where's that partner of crime of yours, Price? <laughs> right here, sir. <laughs> he said, looks like you two are still getting yourselves into hot water. <laughs> so, so we went down and... Uh, Colonel Shoemaker joined our merry band, and uh, he was limping a little bit. And then we hooked up with the rest of the company. And uh, we were still under fire. It got dark, and we had to pull back about, oh, about eight, 900 meters and, and set up uh, NDP, night defense positions, uh, in the rice pad. They didn't want to set up in the woods because uh, Char that would be too much of an advantage for Charlie, you know. So we sat out right in the rice paddy, the companies did, A Company and Bravo Company. And uh, that night, it was when we were setting up. It was really dark. Everybody's like, I mean, this was our first real combat. And uh, everybody's in a state of shock. And uh, walking on the dikes because it was raining. And uh, uh, suddenly, because they, they were they kind of, my squad was gone. I, there was only three of us that had not been killed or medevac bound. Me, Price, and uh, Lopez. Lopez was an M79 Grenadier, and we three had not been hit. Everybody else was either hit or dead. Romano was dead. Chambly was dying. He hadn't died yet. And uh, so 
uh, we're setting up that night and they kind of ad hoc uh, the squad because we were a squad. We had you're supposed to have 11 guys. We had three guys from the whole first squad. So we're kind of like combining with another squad in the platoon and all that. And suddenly there's a guy walking towards us because it was dark now. And and one guy said, hey, man, get on the dike. You know, why are you walking through the water? You know, because the rice paddy was that high with water, you know, and the, not answering. And he got closer and somebody yelled, uh, it's a dink, it's a dink, and fire, kill him, kill him. So everybody just turned with their rifles and just started firing fully automatic. And this guy went down in the water. We went over to him. We had a red lens flashlight and uh, checked him out. Yeah, he was, he was a dead VC, all right. And so, but we didn't check him out really until the next morning. So the next morning we looked and saw this guy. I'll never forget, he had a bandolier of ammo on him. He had a grenade. He had a straight razor, okay. He had a wallet with a picture, probably his wife and kid. And he, and he, and he had like uh, a 400 piastres, which is like $3 and something in the U.S. In Vietnamese money, that's what he had. But he he was because the bandolier is useless, and he had a Chicom potato masher type grenade, and a straight razor. And he just kept walking towards us, and then of course he died quickly. So that net after that, I was kind of wild. So that morning we thought we were all getting ready to be extracted and go back to Hong back to base camp. We had to go back up the valley and make another assault, and everybody was pissed. And then the squad leader, this other squad leader, the guy that took over, combined our squad, that squad, and he made, I'm an E2, and he made me his assistant squad leader. Nobody bitched about that, which was weird, because guys outranked me. But he, he says, Mark, I'm going to have you use my assistant until we get back to NK. So, okay, fine. So uh, uh, they were pissed off that we were going back up that valley again. And uh, so we trudged back to the valley. This time they had all the rifle companies, you had Charlie Company, Bravo Company, Alpha Company. We were all on right where that, where the wide is, just before it bottlenecks. But this time we're not in the creek bed, we're up on the rice paddy itself. And then the tree line and the hills are right in front of us. We were doing an actual all out assault. And uh, so we're, we're laying behind the, rice paddy dykes, getting getting ready to go. And uh, Colonel Shoemaker was limping with a, he, my company commander was going with him and they had the radio operators with him and they were coming by and he was, you know, giving the troops morale and stuff. And he came by and looked at me and he said, our old Martin, how are you doing, son? <laughs> I said, a little tired, sir. I was going to get up. And he says, no, no, Martin. He says, you, you rest there. You just don't, don't bother getting up. He said, I think we're all a little bit tired. He said, uh, good luck. And he walked away. And uh, then we all got into the position. And then the first time I'd ever heard these words, fix bayonets. And uh, oh my God, this, like the reality was hitting me in the face. Uh, you know, you know, you're putting it on. And, and I looked down the line and it looked almost medieval to me with the bayonets on, on the rifles. And I said, where the hell are we? <laughs> I go, oh, man. <laughs> we didn't know what we were going to hit or what it was going to be. But it all turns out good. Uh, they brought in artillery. So we had to get down because the artillery and the napalm was just going nuts. They were bringing in the Sky Raiders, gunships and stuff. They were just pasting the tree line and those hills and they're just going, wow, you know. So... Then the whistle started, first platoon on your feet, move out. Now platoons, each company, were running towards the objective. As soon as I got up, I started waiting for the, the feel of steel, hot lead going through me. Didn't have, got to the next row of dikes, got down, and you're, you're breathing. <sighs> okay, got to get up, move again, and nothing happened, nothing happened. All the way into the tree line, they were gone. They were all gone. Uh, there were the, all the fighting positions had been abandoned, blood and bandages, napalm. You ever seen dried napalm? It's like kind of reminds me of styrofoam, but it's uh, all 
stuck to the trees and everything. It, it, but it, it hardens like kind of like styrofoam, and it has its own weird smell to it. Very weird. And uh, there were and there were dead enemy bodies there with napalm on them and all that. But uh, they were gone. They in the night they they got up and moved out. So that was Operation Shiny Bayonet. October 10th to October 13th, 1965. That was my first. That was my, I call it in my book, the baptism. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, that's uh, probably one of the most intense, <laughs> that, that, that whole engagement sounds just so incredibly intense for your first real time. Yeah, my buddy, well, my best friend, Eddie, he was in D Company. And uh, you know they're getting radio messages. He he was he, he was like uh, a radio operator for company commander in D Company, and uh, uh, he was hitting all these messages. And, and that's Martin Squad. And then the rumors, you know, rumors are flying. Mm -hmm. Oh, the entire Mar the first squad, first platoon is all dead. I mean, all these you know these things get exacerbated, and, and it was just going crazy. And he, and he thought I was dead. And then we all, because each company, they took, we took turns going back. They, a different lift would come up and pick us up and take us back to base camp. So uh, I'm back in base camp. I'm walking, they have the big battalion street that goes to the, we call it the mess hall, but it was big, big tent there with, where they serve food and stuff. And I was walking towards there. We, we all got back. We, we got back and then Eddie saw me walking down the, the battalion street. If you want to, it's like an old dirt road. And, and he's looking and I'm looking. He goes running to me and grabs me, you know. <laughs> and so that, that day we're sitting there and we're having a couple of beers that night. And I said, man, I don't know. I said, if it's going to be this way every time we go out. <laughs> said, See, our D-Rose date was going to be August. We got, we got the month of August off because we were actually on the ship in August. But we got credit for our tour of duty. So we got a month not actually in Vietnam, but on the ship, but we got that as a credit. So our d rose day would be August of 66. By the way, not one from my original 11-man squad, first squad, Bravo Company, first platoon, not one man of the original first squad that came over on the ship made it to August, not one, not one. We ended up four dead and seven all wounded. I was the last of the original first squad to be a medevac, and that was in May of 66. Not one guy in our original squad made it to August. Not one. And so out of the original 11 guys, 11 or four were dead and seven wounded. But I, I told Eddie, they were, and I said, man, if every time we go out and it's going to be like this, we're gonna go home a lot sooner than August. <laughs> I said, and I just hope it's not in a box. <laughs> he said, oh man. He said, that's a hell of a note, man. Your first taste of combat and this is it? <laughs> anyway, that was, that was my baptism. So anyway, I got, and in May of 66, uh, I get I got some shrapnel uh, in my back um, from a grenade, a Chicon grenade, and uh, it wasn't serious, but I was walking wounded for a day and a half, so I didn't get medevac, so it got infected. So when they did medevac me, you know, the worst part was the damn penicillin shots. I mean, they were shooting me in the ass. This nurse was far too happy to do it. She was delighted to do it every morning, and it started to hurt. But, uh, oh, what cheek do we want it in today, Private? You know. <laughs> so, anyway, while I was, because I, I was going to be in the hospital for a week or so, and then they were going to put me on light duty and send me back to my unit. And I probably wouldn't go to the field for three or four weeks. That would have been it. I wasn't going to get medevac out of country. But. I came down with falciparum malaria while I was in the hospital. Falciparum, there's two types, there's two strains in Vietnam. Falciparum is deadly. It will kill you if you don't treat it. 
And then you have Vivax, which is a much milder type of malaria. That's not going to kill you, Vivax won't. You're in the hospital for a couple of weeks and then you're, you're back. But falciparum, once you get over the worst part, it's an automatic 30 days observation. You can't go to your, back to your unit for 30 days after you're healed. Okay? And every day, they take blood from you for 30 days. Every day. I mean, we call the guy you come in with the cart, you know, the lab tubes there, we call him Vamp. Here comes Vamp, you know, the vampire. You know, get it, you know, after a while, you can't take it out of your arm. Now they're taking it out of your fingers, you know. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, so I got medevac to Japan. And this is like in uh, uh, late May, uh, June, yeah, late May of 66. Uh, uh, and I was in Japan for another month. Now I'm under 90 days. So when I finally get cut loose in Japan... I'm under 90 days before my ETS is up. So, uh, I mean, I wasn't exactly a sterling soldier, you know, back at Fort Benning. And I'm still, a P I'm, they made me a PFCE3, you know, whoop de do. Uh, and my buddy and I, Eddie, we we're going to go to California. We we're going to have this great pad on the beach, the chicks. I mean, this was our dream. And uh, I'm going, I'm going to get out of the Army. Okay. So, uh, uh, they said, you, you, you can go back to your unit, or if you're under 90 days, you can go back to the States and get out of the Army. Well, Eddie, he'd been in bef a little bit before me. He, in July, he'd already got he, got, he went home in July and got out already, okay? I didn't want to wait till August. Eddie's already back home. I said, no, no, I'll go back, I'll go back. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to get out. So I didn't go back to, to Vietnam on that tour. I went back and I got processed out and I got out of the army for a couple of months and Eddie and I we had our place on the beach and everything else but things for me just didn't things I had to go back and I it's it's that's a long story in itself you know I was engaged to a girl I went back she, it was and I just and I, I told Eddie in our apartment I said you got to tell Rosie he said what you're going back to Vietnam, going back to the army after all we planned and everything, and now you want you want me to go tell Rosie Sol uh, de la Vista, huh? You know what kind of shit is it? <laughs> <laughs> then I went back, and that was it. I stayed twenty years. And why why did you want to go back? What what was it? Because I, I will never forget it, and I describe it in the book. I'm sitting there waiting. Eddie hasn't home yet from work. I was starting Pasadena Junior High School, a junior high school, junior college, and uh, working for a, a veterinarian who, by the way, uh, uh, said he would sponsor me for medical school uh, because the Army would pay my four years, the GI Bill of college, and he would sponsor me through medical school, but I had to find sign a contract that I would be working. He, man, he's making money hand over fist, you know, old, rich old ladies poodles in Pasadena, come on. So, and I would work at his clinic, you know, uh, there was a con, I forget how many years after I got out of medical, vet, veterinary medical school, and uh, that was the deal, and he'd pay for it, he'd sponsor it for me, so I didn't have to pay for medical school. And I, and I love animals, of course, and uh, one night I'm sitting there with a TV tray watching uh, uh, the news, and that all too familiar AK-47 sound was in the background. And they were showing the 101st Airborne in Tuiwa. And they're loading wounded up and you could hear the constant firing of the AKs and all of that. And, sh and I'm seeing these guys struggling and everything, getting guys on the chopper and all that. And it just hit me like an epiphany in the, right between the eyes. And I said, because I was trying to, where do I belong? What, I didn't feel a part of the young world that, I was in. I, I, I had just turned 20, just turned 20, and in August. And uh, the young people that I went to school with, because most back this time you didn't have a, a lot because that was the first year of the war, 65 to 66 was the first real year of the war. And there wasn't a lot of Vietnam vets and I really felt different from them. I mean, their their worldview is so much different than mine now. Um, 
we, 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 were, we were not on the same page anymore. And I didn't want to get married. I wasn't ready for that. Uh, it was all sounded nice, but I realized looking at watching the news on TV, that's where I belong. God, God cursed me for it, but that's where I belong. And Eddie came home that night and I told him, and I mean, he, he wasn't happy. And so I ended up finding myself on the site, at the, uh, at the wait for the recruiting office to open up. And, uh, and back, because I had so many bad things, my first three, Article 15, because I got in trouble so much in my first three years. Uh, uh, I mean, I had an honorable discharge. All I got it was all good. But, you know, it has, they have what they call a reenlistment code on your DD-214. And mine was like, yeah, not eligible because of the problems I had in the service. And I'm, sitting, I, and I'm telling the recruiter, all I want to do is go back to Vietnam. He's, well, you know, you got the RE code on it. So his station commander comes out because he has a little office there with glass around it in the back there. And he came out and he picks up my 214 and looks at it and he goes, you have a silver star? I said, yeah, and a Purple Heart. I said, <laughs> he said, let me check on something. So we went back and in the office and he was on the phone. And then he got a big book, a red book, had it down there. He's on the phone talking to somebody and he's nodding his head, puts the phone down because I saw him through the glass there, picks up the book, comes in, sets it down in front of the recruiter and says, read that paragraph right there. Waivers shall be given to all of the Medal of Honor, Navy Cross, or Silver Star. I says, what does that mean? What does that mean? He says, want to leave tomorrow? <laughs> so I went from a civilian, and in five days, I went from civilian to landing in Vietnam again. I was a full-blown civilian. Five days later, I was back in Vietnam. They sent me, I took my test to the next day they sent me to Oakland. I spent about three days in Oakland processing, getting my jungle fatigues, jungle boots, getting your shots, all that stuff. And then I was in Vietnam. So on my fifth day after I went into the recruiting office, I was in Vietnam again. Getting off that plane and it was oh so hot. <laughs> so, I went, so I went four times altogether though. And then I went back, this time I went to the 101st. Uh, October 66 to uh, October 67. I was with the uh, recon platoon, the Hawk recon platoon, uh, 2nd Battalion, 325th uh, Airborne, 327th Airborne Infantry in the 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne Division. They only had, from 65 to 68, they only had one brigade of the 101st in Vietnam, which was three battalions. Uh, and in December of 67, January of 68, they brought the other two brigades from Fort Campbell, Kentucky to Vietnam. So then after, in 1968, you had the full division there. But for the first three years of the war, just 1st Brigade, 101st was there. And these were the guys I saw on the TV because they were getting shot up in a place called Tuiwa, which I did visit. So, uh, and that's why I asked to go there. Because if you were coming on a, on a different tour, you could ask for whatever unit you want to go to. Long, you know, I'm inf you, you know, they're not going to make you a clerk if you're infantry, but you can name your unit though, because you're back on multiple tours. So that was a little thing of discretion they gave the guys coming back for different tours. So I went back to the 101st, and I was in the recon platoon, and that, uh, that got quite dicey too. But anyway, yeah, uh, I just came from Oakland now, right? So I got brand new jungle boots, brand new jungle boots. You know, I got a, old, a brand new baseball cap. I'd, I'm just back in. I don't have my cloth wings sewed on my uniform. I got just metal wings based on there. I look like a cherry right out of jump school is what I look like. I'm, and I'm a PFC now. I'm a private first class. So I'm a cherry out of jump school. And... Uh, so I'm, we're, 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 we're uh, Fan, uh, Fan Rang was the base camp uh, for 1st Brigade 101st. And I was sent to the 2nd Battalion, 325th uh, Airborne Infantry Regiment, 327th. Why do I keep saying 325th? And, uh, and you were out there in front of headquarters company. You know, we got our duffel bags and our orders and stuff. So they have uh, an NCO, uh, this guy was uh, an NCO, uh, was going to 
get us processed in, orientate us, get us to our individual companies and, and all of that, where, where we're going to go. And I was originally going to a company, and so they had us all out there. Well, the battalion had just got back from, they were on some operation, and they just got back, and all the grunts are, are coming back, because he had like tent city there, all the tents and everything. So all the grunts are, are trudging back in, they're getting off the helipad and stuff. Suddenly we're all standing there looking at these guys in, in tiger stripes and bush, no, no helmets. And they had like faded old tiger stripe fatigues. And what the hell? And I hated that damn brain bucket, that steel pot. Man, it baked your brains in it. And uh, the first thing I noticed, they didn't have steel pots on it. That's got my attention. So, and everybody's looking open mouth at these guys. These guys look downright feral. And they're walking by, and we say, hey, Sarge, who, who are these guys with the, with the, with the tiger strike fatigues and, and no helmets? So, oh, that's the Hawk Recon Platoon. Yeah, I said, how do you get in that? He said, oh, you're going to have to, he said, you got to have at least 90 days on the line, you know, in a rifle company before you can even qualify. I said, I got over nine months on the line in a rifle company. He said, what do you mean? Because I look like I just got out of jump school, you know. I said, I was in the first cab last year in the Iodrang Valley, and he says, you were in all that? I go, yeah, and he says, yeah, you have what you call a Form 20 in, in, your, in your pack, and then he looked and he go, he, he says, you have a silver star. And I said, yeah, he says, shit. And he said, oh, and he looks at me and he says, what, and it's from an old clan, but he, this, I heard this before I ever heard Clint Eastwood ever say it. And, 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 he, and he said, What's going on? What are you doing back here? <laughs> and I said, well, I wasn't making much of a living on the outside. He says, hell, he says, dying ain't much of a living either, son. <laughs> what the hell are you doing back here? <laughs> I, so I, anyway, he says, you, you want to go to recon, but I don't think they're, they're going to have a problem. I'm going to go talk to the, the, uh, the uh, S2 officer, which is Intel. He's a, and it was a Hispanic captain. I can't remember his name. And he said, uh, so he had all my stuff out. So he went in the hooch where headquarters was at, came back and he says, the captain will talk to you now. So uh, he went in and he's looking at my stuff. You got a silver star? <laughs> I thought you would be taller, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, he says, well, you want to go to Hawks? He says, I'm sure they'll, they would love you. He says, they're all set up. He told me, you know, about, about 50 yards down here is a group of trees. That's their little area there. They'll all be over there. He says, I'll let, uh, I'll let them know that you're, you're coming over. So I got diverted from going to A Company to the Hawk Recon Platoon. So now I'm, I'm walking and the guys are there. Some of them are cleaning their weapons. They're all sitting around. They, they're all got grubby clothes on, stinky and smelly. And here I come with my nice new blue, or green, never been worn before, jungle fatigues, clean boots, brand new boots, and a baseball cap on. <laughs> and, and this guy named English, I'll never forget him, from Georgia. And he goes, the fuck you think you're going? I mean, I said, I'm coming to the recon platoon. We don't take cherries in the recon platoon. Is that right? I said. So he started going off. He says, well, I've seen it all now. I guess any cherry could come to the recon platoon or going off. Well, Stock, who became my, my team leader, Stock is a story in himself. Probably the, the most professional soldier, officer, enlisted I've ever known in my career, Walt Stock. And uh, Stock came up and said, uh, you're Mar are you Martin? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he says, I'm sorry, in stock. I'm going to be your team leader. And, uh, and he, English, oh, oh, we're letting cherries in the recon platoon now? And Stock said, Martin here was in the first cab last year. He was in the Iodrang Valley battling, earned a silver star. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and his other one, Goodwin, was standing there. And Goodwin's kind of a, kind of a laid back, kind of a lanky kid, but nice guy. He started going, well, English, you put your foot up your own ass again, didn't you? <laughs> he says, man, you Georgia boys sure have a knack for that. 
<laughs> well, English is turned all red in the face. And, well, you know, you look like a charity. Yeah, you don't judge a book by its cover. Or don't they teach you that in Georgia? <laughs> you know, the, the usual crap. <laughs> you know, you. So anyway, that, I got that. And he says, we got another guy coming in, too, from Charlie Company. Uh, that would be George. So now he said, Martin, meet Fallon. So for Fallon meet Martin, we shook hands. And it's funny, the story about George. So George had already been on the line almost three months with Charlie Company you know, already. And uh, so he said, Robert O. He says, what, what does the O stand for? He's got, you know, that Jersey accent, hard Jersey accent. I said, I haven't known you long enough, man. You know, we got a date for a while. <laughs> what, what, is it Oscar? Is it Otis? <laughs> George, I don't know you all. Well, three weeks later, we're going down, we're moving along, we're in a tree line moving along a rice paddy, and then we, we had some sniper fire across the rice paddy. So we're down behind the dike, you know, in this little mound here. And pew, pew, pew! You know, it's going down. We're down there, and I looked at him, and I, I said, it's Otto. What? <laughs> Otto? So, so what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I said, my middle name. He's with me like a car. I said, oh. I said, it's an O. How is that? Do you spell auto car with an O? Jeez. <laughs> I said, what do they teach you in Jersey anyway? So your middle name is, how do you spell that? And I'm like, O-T-T-O. <laughs> and, and, and you figured this is the time to tell George. I said, well, I didn't want something to happen to one of us, and neither no, one of us, you know, you're not getting to know my name. He said, you know, I'll die a lot happier not knowing I know that shit. <laughs> we, we used to get, we get into something bad sometimes. One of us would always look at the other, Georgie and I, and we'd look at each other and go, it's another fine mess they've got us into this time, Stanley. <laughs> and we'd always... <laughs> I see George every year now. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So when you were in that uh, recon platoon, did you have any uh, uh, fighting that compared to what you'd done with the, the first Cav, or was it not a difference? Not small stuff up until, uh, and this is, has got really bad. Uh, um, September 29th, 1967, in fact. Um, yeah, we'd been in some, some, some clashes but nothing on a sustained basis. Uh, I had just come back from R&R &R to Taipei, which was heaven on earth. And, uh, it, was, and it was like September 28th, I got back, uh, back, got back to base camp, got back to the 327th. And uh, first sergeant said, well, you know, you know you, he says, you're getting sh pretty short. Uh, do you want around supervise you know you know sh you know ship burning details you know what ship burning is no uh, okay oh oh yeah, yeah, yeah. in Vietnam yeah, yeah, yeah okay yeah. you know I, I said well what's the platoon doing right now he said oh they're on the, they're on the on the fire base at the talk you know they're just like they're in a QRP you know a quick reaction uh, uh, response QRF quick reaction force and, and the rest of the battalion are down sweeping in this valley okay. Oh, man, I went back here supervising shit details. I said, no, I just, no, I got, I've been with these guys all this time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with them until it's time for, because I was getting ready to go back to Fan Rang and start clearing in uh, about uh, uh, 10 days. I was getting short, you know, on that second tour. And so I, he said, all right, we'll pack your ruck up and uh, shop, you know, log birds coming in and uh, they're going to go back and, you know, taking stuff out to the talk and you will join the platoon. So I did. And I got there, and sure enough, the guys are all sitting around playing cards and, you know, not doing too much shit. And I thought, this is all good. This is good. So the next day, this is September 29th. Uh, I know these dates. So the next day, all day was kind of, but in the afternoon, around 3 or 4 in the afternoon, we started hearing, because we didn't know what was going on, all this fire. This is the Quezon Valley. I had no idea what the Quezon Valley was, and, it, and, it, and it's in southern i uh, in the uh, Chulai Tamki area, home of, the, at that time I didn't know either, of the 2nd North Vietnamese Division. 
And, uh, and these guys were supposed to be hard asses. I didn't know anything about them then. It was just another valley to me. So rifle companies were down there. Recon was QRF. We're sitting up on the talk, playing cards, smoking and joking, all that good stuff. And uh, the firing started in the late afternoon, three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And you could hear American fire and you could hear enemy fire, AK-47, enemy machine gun, rockets, M79s going up, M M60 machine gun. And then suddenly you weren't hearing the American weapons a lot. You were hearing more enemy weapons. And we're all looking at each other because this, none of this is good. And a runner from the Colonel's Hooch came over. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, <coughs> Lieutenant McKnight, that was the recon platoon leader. Lieutenant McKnight, Colonel needs to see you at the at the hooch right now. Bring your map. So Lieutenant Mike grabbed his map and went over to the Colonel's hooch. Just, we're just all standing around waiting. About three minutes later, Lieutenant McKnight comes running back. Hawks, Hawks, all right, gear up, gear up. Don't get your rucks. Don't get your rucks. Ammo, ammo. Just get ammo. And then he gave us what they call a frag order. And and, and, and he said, uh, uh, one of the platoons, I think it was Fourth Platoon and Charlie Company, they're in some serious shit. A Company's coming in one direction. We're coming in from the other. They're in serious shit right now. We're going to land not on that. We're going to land like about uh, a click, which is like three quarters of a mile away from theirs, because it was a good LZ right there. And then we would move through the tree line towards them. A Company was coming in from another direction to reinforce them as well. So... Uh, here we are, we're bundled up. We're on like a little mountaintop thing. And you could only put one bird down, touch down, and then the next and the next and the next. And we had like four birds. There's only like 20 of us in the recon platoon. So uh, <clears throat> I was in the uh, third bird. And uh, so I'm getting in there and we had this one new guy. He had a French sounding name. He'd only been in the platoon a couple of weeks. Big guy. And so we had the radio on him. So when I got on the bird, I asked the, the crew chief or the, or the door gunner, I forget which, I said, what's the situation on the ground right now? Because I was team leader now. And uh, they said, you know, just nothing going on. Nothing. Okay, good, 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 good. So here we are, and we're stacked like that. First chopper, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking, you know, watching the choppers land. Here we come in. It's big field, foothills, tree line to the right, and elephant grass all in elephant grass on the landing zone. So I see the first chopper with recon coming. Guys all jump off, head for the tree line. Second chopper's coming in, green tracers. <laughs> coming all over it. And I'm like, oh shit. And I looked at the crew chief like that and he goes. <laughs> and I looked at George and he said, he's, he's laying back on his rock. It's another fine mess they've got it in this time, isn't it? <laughs> I said, indeed. <laughs> so we can't, we're getting hit up. My, I, well, before we start landing, so I got this guy with the radio, the big French guy. Well, I don't know if he's French, but he had a French sounding last name. I didn't know him very well. And I got him and I'm right behind him. I don't want to be on the ground without a radio, okay? I know what we're gonna do. We're all headed for the tree line. We're gonna move by the tree line towards where Charlie Company's uh, fourth platoon was in the shit. Uh, so I knew the plan. And I knew what direction from the LZ that we'd be moving into the tree line. So thank good, thank goodness for compasses too. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> so we're getting right, we're, we're like 15 feet before we get hit, we're in. Thank goodness we didn't have rucksacks on. My guy that I had sitting in the door with the radio on, takes a round right through the leg, hits his frimmer. He's like, and it's like a water hose with blood coming out. It's hit, hit his femoral artery. And we're drag we, he's not going to be any good on the ground on us. So we're dragging this big guy, getting him back in. We're slipping on blood on the, the pilot and the co-pilot. Get off this fucking bird. Get off this bird now. They we're taking hits and stuff. So we finally get this guy, and he's laying on his back on the floor. And then we all go running out and jump down. Chopper was lifting up to like 20 feet. And we're all running out. We didn't have rucksacks on, though. So we all jumped out. Nobody got hurt. And, you know, this <laughs> going over our heads, you know, and we're down, now we're down in the elephant grass. So we're, we're cut, we're, we're, we're hidden. And so we wait for the firing to stop over our head. Now it's all quiet. And I realized I don't have a radio. <laughs> 
I go, yes, it's another fine situation we're finding ourselves into, George. <laughs> And so I'm thinking, all right, what to do? So I'm getting, I'm getting my compass out. I know we got to go on an azimuth and such and such. Okay, okay, I, I know. I'm not going to stand up. And nobody wants to stand up in the team, okay? So we're on our hands and knees crawling in the hell of the ground. And then, and then we hear, hey, Hawk 1-2, one, 1-2. Two, one, two. You had Hawk 1-1, one, one, Hawk 1-2, one, Hawk 1-3. One, Those you call signs for each team. Martin. I said, yes. <laughs> he said, where are you guys? What are you doing? I says, we're hiding. We don't want to be shot. <laughs> well, we're all in the tree line. Why aren't you on the radio? Well, probably because we don't have a radio. <laughs> that would answer that. <laughs> and he said, well, why are you down there? Well, stand up so we can see you. This is the lieutenant, you know. So I said, okay, I'll smile so you can see us. <laughs> so we all stood up very hesitantly, looking around like that, you know. And then we saw the guys wrestle platoon in the tree line, and they're waving. <laughs> so I, I think it's safe, guys. So we, all, we joined platoon. By the time we got to the location where Charlie Company's platoon had gotten hit like real bad. It was over. And uh, so we started, and they, A Company pulled in that night too as well and set up an NDP there. We actually, a Recon actually took over the old NVA positions, but we didn't have our rucks, we didn't have our poncho liners, we didn't have our ponchos for rain, and it was raining again. It never stopped raining for the next 10 days. And uh, it was just horrific. And uh, 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 we're out there all night, because we really couldn't see much, because it was dark by the time we got there, and it was raining, and nobody really wanted to go explore the battlefield at that point. So the next morning, you know, they had nine dead in the platoon, including the, the platoon leader. And there was this one uh, black guy uh, who was dead. He looked like he was on point or something. But he was laying in it, had that, you know, dead of the eyes. And, but it, it looked like and his helmet was half off his head. And it looked like he was pointing. And I took, and I followed the direction. He was, that was an NVA machine gun position. Because I, I went right where his, fing, his dead finger was like that. And I, I walked there and all kinds of casings, shell casings. And it was, you could tell it was like a, for an art, was a light machine gun position. NVA, RPD machine gun. And that's probably what killed him just before he died. But he, I think he was pointing. It just when he, at the same time he was hit, it must have been. So <clears throat> we formed up. A company formed up. Recon took point uh, in, for the battalion. A company, Charlie Company, Bravo Company uh, was in the foothills somewhere. I'm not sure where at the disposition of all the companies, but I know A Company was right behind us, following us, about a click behind us. And uh, for the next uh, nine days, um, we were fighting every day. And it culminated on October 8th, 1967. <clears throat> on October 5th, uh, I was on point all day. And the lieutenant said, you know, you're a team leader, you're not supposed to be on point all day. If you want, you, you can walk slack, but not point all day. Because I've been point all afternoon, or all morning. So we stopped for a map check and a quick chow break on the trail that the rifle companies had lovingly called Slaughter Alley. And the reports came in, first we were up against an NVA battalion, and they said, well, it might be a regiment. And then we realized, like in, a week later, we were fighting the, the second North Vietnamese division. And it was horrific. And uh, on October 5th, I mean, I had a lot of experiences, but one thing really stands out is October 5th, uh, uh, we changed, a guy named Hoffman, and I changed point positions. He was on, I was on point, and it was around noontime. And, uh, and the LT said, well, let somebody else go point, and then you can walk slack if you want. That's the guy right behind the point man. And okay, so Hoffman said, oh, I'll do point. So uh, 15 minutes later, we're walking down that trail, and we walk right up against a, a machine gun position, and it opened up, and it hit Hoffman was dead before he hit the ground. We were about the same size, about the same height. He was dead before he hit the ground. And we were pinned down there, we were getting hit from the left. But that machine gun position was devastating. And uh, <clears throat> I 
I didn't know. I, I saw him because I, I saw him Hoffman there. I didn't, and I saw him disappear. So I wasn't sure at that moment if he was dead or not. I didn't know. So I'm I got off the trail because that trail was being chewed alive. It was being chewed alive. I mean, it's like that far. I'm that far from the trail, and you can just see that trail getting ripped up. And it, you know, shooting a machine gun is one thing, but when you're under fire from one, it's a totally different story. And you just saying, please, Lord, just cover me up somewhere and keep me safe. Anyway, so I'm taking, uh, uh, I'm crawling on the sideline there because I got about that much wide of just jungle and brush. Then there's the trail, and then there's a deep gorge there in a stream bed. And then it's open rice paddy and then tree line over there. So I'm crawling in the bush trying to get up to where Hoffman is at, but not on the trail. I'm not crawling on that damn trail. And uh, and I'm, everybody, I'm yelling, Hoffman, Hoffman not answered so i got up and up just about from here to to the wall over there i saw the back of his boot just laying there and he's not responding and uh i said hoffman's i see his boot i see his boot and then platoon sergeant mcknight are yelling at me don't get up don't get up because we're still under fire so and i kept yelling hoffman hoffman so i crawled up a little further and he, he was there was just no movement at all and my every instinct told me it was dead. And so Lieutenant called in Artie and walked it back in. And uh, I took care of the problem. And uh, then Doc came running up and they, him and uh, Sergeant Gettings got uh, Hoffman. And Doc looked at me out because I'm still laying by the trail. He just shook his head at me like that. You know, he was hit through the heart, through the neck. You know, he, 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 he said, he said, Bob, he said, he was dead when he hit the ground. He's, there was no hope. It was that bad. So that freaked me out because it should have been me. And that always freaked me out that that happened in the Quezon Valley. A lot of other nasty stories happened there, but it culminated on October 8th. And uh, A Company, Colonel had given directions uh, that he didn't want anybody traveling by platoon alone. The only people out there stupid enough to run around by platoon alone were the hawks. <laughs> <laughs> but he wanted the rifle companies to stay together. Well, everybody was, we've been fighting for the last heavy, every day almost. Everybody was down on ammo. This is the only time I ever got into hand-to-hand -hand fighting in four tours. And uh, we were down on ammo, food. Ah, oh, we didn't need water. <laughs> Never stopped raining. <laughs> and so uh, on the 8th of October we were supposed to hook up Charlie Company, A Company B Company was off in the foothills somewhere but Charlie Company, A Company uh, they resupplied Charlie Company and then A Company was supposed to send guys, wasn't that far over there and pick up A Company stuff, bring it back to A Company recon, we'd come up because we were coming up that trail still, we'd come up and get our chow and stuff and we were hardly had any ammo left because we, we, we were fighting and uh and it was drizzling it was raining and or i'm, lo I'm desperately looking for a magazine it's like they're all empty and at that moment in time suddenly because you got trails coming this way trails leading up to the to the foothills and all that a trail like was like 15 feet away I just suddenly saw an NVA running on the trail that way. So I popped off a car. I don't know if I hit him or not. Because that's all I had was the pistol. It's all happening. All this happened in like in a nanosecond. The next thing I know, an NVA is running at me with a bayonet. Okay. Well, I'm, he's from me to you. And I kill him right there on the spot. Right behind him. Then I get, I get down in a, in a kind of a crouch. And I'm, I'm still looking for magazines. But that's no good, because another guy comes running right behind the guy I just shot. And fortu unfortunately, well, fortunately for me, I was able to move in such a way with the, with the, the bayonet went through my, my canvas, my gear here, okay? And in all that nanosecond, I threw the empty, because the pistol was empty, and I threw it in his face, which knocked him back, and I was able to extract the AK-47 and the bayonet, and then I killed him with it. So all, that all happened in like in two seconds. It's that fast. George had his hands full. And George was on point, yeah. And uh, 
it happened so fast. Anyway, uh, I was I was well overdue by now to be back clearing going back home. And uh, so we set up, dug in and got set up for the night because in the morning they expected something bad to happen because they never stopped raining. We couldn't get air support because of the rain. We got out already, but we couldn't get air support. And that's why we had a hard time getting resupplied and all of that stuff. So, uh, uh, I'm laying there thinking, yeah, I should be back. I should be getting ready to go home right now. I'm thinking, <laughs> just shaking my head to myself. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so that, I woke up, it was morning, and, 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 I, and I looked up, and the clouds, all that dark clouds for the last 10 days, bright blue skies and sun was coming through, jets were rolling in, they were lighting everything up right for like, 200 degrees around us, everything, napalm coming up. And they, the, the, the facts, you know, the, the, the spotter planes and stuff, they're seeing literally hundreds and hundreds of NVA all moving off and they, they were moving towards us. Hundreds of NVA. And uh, I said, thank you, Lord, thank you. <laughs> so I got uh, taken out on the 9th of October and sent back to Fan Rang and went home. That was my second tour. But that was a bad one, uh, Quezon Valley. So from, I was there in the Quezon from September 29th to the morning of 9th of October, fighting every day. I walked in my sleep one night when we were on a six-man ambush too. Oh, that was scary. <laughs> I didn't know where I was at when I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about freaking out. <laughs> and the rain was still coming down. <laughs> hawks, hawks, where are you? Oh, God, I didn't have a rucksack, I can have a weapon. I'm laying against a hooch. We didn't sit up by any hooches. <laughs> I can't see my hand in front of me. <laughs> and you can't go yelling. I'm going, hawks, hawks, hawks. And I heard, well, Martin, Martin. Oh shit, where are you? Where are you? So, and I, I, just, I just, just keep talking, let me find your voice. Oh my God, I was like only 30 feet away. Because it was a trail going through these hooches and we were setting off the trail in a six man ambush position. Nobody came that night, but it sure scared the piss out of me. <laughs> and then one night, uh, it was right, in fact, this is right after Hoffman was killed. Uh, uh, that, in fact, that night, uh, they, after we extract, got Hoffman's body extracted, and then it was getting towards, getting dark, and all. they said, okay, they're going to set us up. So they took us about, oh, 70, 80 yards up into the bush, into the foot, the lower foothill area, and we set up a little platoon CP there. So it's getting night, I thought, okay, good, everybody get a good night's rest, you know, we have guards set up, and... LT's on the, on the on the horn with the with the with the talk. Now they want to send a six man team to go at you know slaughter alley. At night they they're gonna send a six man team to go ambush it. Okay, this is where Hoffman was killed earlier that day. Okay, so uh, LT calls me over. He says, "Well, I need you to take a, you know, your your team." <laughs> You want me to go down there tonight? <laughs> it's dark. <laughs> okay, you know Fallon's looking at me. They're looking at me. This is bullshit, man. I said, just so we're so scared because we're not taking rocks. We're just taking our overnight stuff. We're sliding on our ass down the hill to the trail. We, we don't even want to walk, and we get on the trail. I got George on point, and I'm walking behind him, and the, rest of the other four guys are behind me. So we're walking real quiet. And then suddenly we, and George says, listen, listen. I go, what? Listen. And he goes, up ahead. It was Vietnamese. The, no, no farmers are out work, walking the, the woods in this valley tonight. <laughs> Nobody's taking us, no quiet, innocent Vietnamese are taking strolls at night here, okay? 
I said, holy shit. Well, I don't know how many are there. Do they know we're here? What? I got, I got me, including, I, think I, got, I got six guys. No, I didn't. I had five guys, including myself. I had, well, the other guy was not with us. Okay. So, and everybody's, they're, we're all, you know, up on everybody. What the fuck is going on? I said, shit. So I said, I said all right, guys, this is what we're going to do. You know, but I'm not going to do this unless everybody's on board. I said, we're taking a 90 degree. We're going to go way up in the brush. We're going to burrow in like little rabbits, okay? And we'll have one man. There's only five of us. We're going to have one man pulling guard at a time. We'll all get some out. We'll get some sleep tonight. One guy stays awake. And we do sit rep checks with when we get sit rep because we'll sit. What's your, what's your sit rep situation report? You know, all clear over, you know, and that's it. So I said, and I'm not. I'm not walking down this fucking slaughter alley any farther, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we had to, all night, we got a few hours of sleep, woke up next morning, and, oh, before we went, you know, we, 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 we signed off for the night, and I said, we are on our tiger posture at this time. Tiger posture means ambush position, ambush site. We are in the Alpha Bravo uh, tiger posture at this time. Uh, okay, you guys keep safe out there. Okay, yeah, you know it. <laughs> Next morning, he called us to come back in. Didn't see anything. <laughs> I know you guys wrapped me out on this. I said, I'm, I'm not only doing it to save my ass, but I'm doing it to save your asses too. Yeah, who wants to go down this trail? Oh, let me see a show of hands. Yeah, nobody? Okay. <laughs> so that was one of the other little incidents in that 10 day period. Yeah. God, it was awful. It's so when I, we we're talking about PTSD. That's uh, so when I came home from that. And uh, uh, my, it was my first or second night at home, and I had my, my, my German Shepherd Duke. Uh, yeah. And I, well, I went to sleep, and the next thing I remember, I mean, I had some horrific something happen, but I can't remember it. But I'm sitting all the way up in the bed, my eyes are opened, but I'm still asleep and I'm screaming and yelling. I'm in the bed. My mom, my sister, and my dog Duke are all on the bedside looking at me. And suddenly I'm awake, but my eyes had been open, but I was still asleep, which makes no sense. And they said, you're yelling that they're all over us. They're everywhere. You're screaming. And I'm looking at them and I don't even know how I got there. I'm sitting there in the but I guess I was yelling and screaming because I was sitting up in bed and that's when uh, the sleepwalking really started. And for years after Vietnam, after everything, I, I'd go to bed at night, I'd end up with no clothes on in a fetal position behind the couch sleeping or in the back door, the back door or something, uh, walking into places, sleepwalking. One night, uh, a buddy and I were having, we shared a, a, an apartment outside of Fort Ord, California, and he had his girlfriend over and I had my girlfriend over. We had two different bedrooms. I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. The next thing I remember, and I'm, I don't have any clothes on, I'm in my buddy's room and I'm telling him to move over. <laughs> the girl didn't wake up. He, Bob, what are you doing? Bob, what are you doing? I, what the hell? <laughs> I went and ran, ran back to my bedroom. <laughs> oh, that happened often. <laughs> and uh, the shrink said, yeah, it, it, you know, back then they called it something else, but that was all signs of PTSD. Absolutely. Yeah. And it wasn't until 9-11 uh, until I actually really addressed it. And in two years, one-on-one. -on -one, um, and it, it did a lot for me. But those are some of the highlights. I ended up on a place called Hamburger Hill in 1969. Is that your third tour? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that was uh, quite dicey in itself. Got wounded there, but I didn't get a Purple Heart because I didn't know I was wounded until the night before I left to go back to the States. Yeah. Uh, 
because I, 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 didn't, I, I, I got there on the 7th, the battle started on the uh, 10th of May, 1969, in Hamburger Hills, actually Hill 937 in the Ashaw Valley. And uh, I was getting ready to go home. And, uh, and then I was gonna come back and uh, the battle had started and it was awful. They were bringing bodies and wounded back to the base camp. I was seeing the choppers coming in. And uh, at four o'clock on the morning of the 17th of May, uh, they came into the NCOs, which I was an E6 then, Staff Sergeant, E6. And, uh, you know, drop your cocks and grab your socks, boys. Fill it, get those rucks filled up. We need you on that hill. And uh, I went out to a platoon, took a platoon, lieutenant was gone, platoon sergeant was gone. A uh, platoon, you're supposed to, you know, you're supposed, in a platoon, you're, in a regular platoon full strength, you got about 45 guys at that time. Vietnam, you were, you were lucky to have 30. And what I had uh, when I got to that platoon, and I was the platoon sergeant and platoon leader, I was the highest ranking guy there. There was an E5 there. Uh, and he'd be my, like my assistant. There was like 15, 14, 15 guys, including myself, and half of those guys were already walking wounded. Okay, that was left of that platoon. And so the next uh, three and a half days, I had to lead that platoon up that hill. And uh, I started wondering if I might, my, my son was born that January of 69, Christopher, my, first, my son. I hadn't even, I'd seen pictures of him, but, you know, my wife sent that to me. That's my ex-wife, not my wife now. And uh, I hadn't even seen him yet. And I was going to extend again. And I thought, no, 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 I'm, I'm going, I'm going home. I'm not coming back after this. Because Nixon was saying how, okay, they're going to let the Arvin, the South Vietnamese army take over the primary role of the war. And Americans, uh, I said, if this is a secondary role, I sure hate to see a primary role. Because this, I mean, where are we at? Omaha Beach here, you know? What the hell's going on? This is some of the worst intense fighting. It was awful. And uh, I mean, I, I, and I thought, boy, I didn't get wounded. Well, they sent us out, they came, you know, from Camp Eagle, and they, they sent us out to the fire base uh, that was supporting the battle on the hill. And it was general orders. Everybody had to put a flak jacket on. In the army, we didn't we didn't we didn't hump with flak jackets. The Marines did, but they didn't hump like grunts in the army did. We humped longer, and we were longer out there. Uh, Marines had a different setup, and they were always in flak jackets. Marines were. I don't know why. that was just Marines, and uh, so I had to, it was uh, required to wear it, and it might have saved my life because down back down in Benoit, the next day I'm going home next morning. I'm leaving for uh, 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 Cameron Bay, which was the one of the places that people come in and people go back to the States. And uh, we're all outside having some beers and stuff. I had a t-shirt on. And what the hell? Uh, little, little fragments coming out of my arm on, this, on my left side here, all up in here, fragments. I didn't even know. And he said, hell, Sarge, those are fragments. Those, they could have been from a grenade. They could have been from. They could have been from a mortar. They could have been from a rock. I mean, they're, they're small little fragments. I did. I didn't even know they were there. And then I thought about that flak vest because the flak vest it won't stop an AK-40. It'll go. It'll cut right through you. It won't stop a big hunk of shrapnel either. It'll it'll kill you too. That flak. The only thing good about the flak jackets they had in Vietnam, small fragments won't hurt you. The smaller fragments. Big fragments or an AK-47 is going to kill you. It's not going to protect you at all. But anyway, and I resented having to wear it. Then I started thinking about it. I'd already turned it in. And I said, man, I'd like to examine that because if I got fragments in here, what about in here? And I said, man, I'd give anything to look at that flag vest right now that I had, but that was impossible. So I said, and they said, well, next thing in the morning, tomorrow morning, Sarge, go, you know, go, go over to the, the medic's hooch and then put in, you know, that's another Purple Heart. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to be on, on a plane going to Cameron Bay and then on another plane taking me back to the world to see my wife and kid. <laughs> that's where I'm going. <laughs> 
I'm not going to stand around and wait for some bureaucratic bullshit to happen to get another Purple Heart. I already got, well, I ended up, I had two then. I ended up with three because I got wounded again in 70. But, uh, so I go home, right? going to be with my wife and kid. I'm not coming to come back. I said, I'm not extending. I'm not going to be back. And three months later, my wife and kid say adios. <laughs> and three months after that, I'm back in Vietnam for my fourth tour. So I went back to Vietnam in February of 70. And then I got wounded on November 6, 1970 again. I was burned. Uh, You're a Green Beret at this point? No, no. Special Forces, uh, I got in, uh, when, I, when I came to uh, Vietnam in uh, uh, my third tour, uh, because I'd gone through the Special Forces when I was in a recon platoon and as an NCO, I went through the, the Recondo, Special Forces Recondo, MACV Recondo School, held at the S The SFOB is the Special Forces Operations Base. That's the headquarters of the 5th Special Forces Group in Vietnam. And the Recondo School is like a mini ranger school. The only difference is your last three-day exercise is for real. It's, it's not a play. It's not, it's a, you can be shot and killed in it. So, but it's it, you know, more than 50% do not go, get through it. And you have, we had guys from Australia in it, uh, different units, all different types of units, all recon and, and LERP units. Okay. And these are combat veterans, these guys that are going? Oh, yeah, they're in Vietnam. See, this is an in Vietnam school. You're in Vietnam, and your last three days, like your final exercise, you go on a real mission. This mission is for real. You, you can hit bad guys. They've had guys killed in Recondo school, okay? We didn't make contact in my class. It went off fine, I graduated, but I, I got through that. So, and I wanted to go to SOG, CNC. SOG is, well, they, some people think it's a, a, a special operations group. SOG means studies and observation group. But it is, these are the guys that go into Laos and even North Vietnam. They work with Chinese nuns. They're like they're mercenaries, and they hate communists. You have two special forces guys on each team. You have missions going into Cambodia, uh, uh, Laos, and even North Vietnam. So highly, at that time, was highly secret. Okay, I wanted to be a part of that. Uh, either that, or or in one of the Mike forces. Mike forces. Uh, you got a, you have four cores in Vietnam, and you got a Mike Force for each course. Mike Force, they go on their own blackjack operations. Um, they, 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 and their primary, if a special forces camp is getting overrun or getting hit, they come into the battle. The Mike Force does. They're separate and independent of the A teams, okay, and uh, and that's what they are. And they're in the field on an A team. You're not beating the bush like you are in either Mike Force or SOG. You're in the, that's your primary job. Big difference between an A-team and one of those elite units like Mike Force or SOG. Uh, A-team, you're an advisor. And you have uh, an LDB counterpart. What's LLDB? Well, in Vietnamese, it means Luc Lung Dac Viet, which means special forces in Vietnamese. We used it as little lion dirty bastards. And so uh, there was an incident. <laughs> I had an incident with my LLDB counterpart. And then they sent me back to the C team, which was like you got one C team in each corps. It's like the headquarters of that corps. I was in three corps at the time. The C team was back in Benoit. They had the, the sergeant major of the C team was a guy by the name of Johnson. He had a great big red bulbous nose. Kind of reminded me of... Uh, Who's that? Sorry, what you know? What's his name? The old yeah, you know, he had a red bulbous nose, and everybody you know called him the Apple. That was his nickname because the big red nose. <laughs> so when I was told after the incident that I had to go back to Benoit and deal with the Apple, <laughs> so I had to pack all my stuff, go back, and my buddy on the camp. I was on an A team. Uh, along the Cambodian border in Three Corps, a place called Tan Lashan. TLC, Tender Loving Care, but it's spelled Tan Le Shan. And um, my buddy said, Man, you got to go back and polish that apple for a while. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I'm not polishing that damn apple. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> and so, as it turns out, the, the apple had me... Now, I wasn't doing squat back in Benoit. I, I was like on a temporary suspension kind of thing. And I'm pissed off because I want to be back in the field again. So, I'm, I'm in the club. I'm having... Jack Daniels has been the... It was Jack Daniels that caused the incident on the A site, and it's Jack Daniels that's causing the second incident there in Benoit. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. It was Jack's fault. But uh, I'm sitting there, and I'm going on about the apple. And I, you know, if he thinks I'm going to sit back here you know, with my thumb up my ass, you know, I want to go to Saga or I'll go to the Mike Force. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dissing the apple. Didn't know the apple was right behind me at another table. So... <laughs> Next morning, I'm in the Apple's office, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, I wasn't shining it. <laughs> you know, he's calling me immature, that I don't belong in Special Forces, all this shit. And I told him, Sir Major, if you're going to just keep me here, you know, watching people, you know, fill sandbags and shit, then you, you can take the beret and put it where the sun don't shine. I, I said... I want. I, I said I'll go back to an American unit and lead real troops. Okay. Oh, so he said, "All right, fine. They got they got a caribou coming in here tonight. Yeah, you, you pack your shit, be on it. You're going back to Natrang. That's the SFOB." Got back there. I basically next day they had orders for me to go to the 173rd. So I went to the 173rd, and I had a great platoon leader. I was a squad leader there. And uh, I was recommended for a direct commission. Some people call it a battlefield commission. So I had to go through all the hoops and loops, the interviews, and your, they, they scan your records. You had to have a, a certain GT score, all, all this. Anyway, I, 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 I passed. And, but I had to leave the 173rd now. But well, they send me back to the... I said, where do you want to go? I said, well, I'd like to go, well, I'll go to the 101st then. And because I was in the 101st before. And uh, so uh, I get back there. Well, hey, just you're just going to be back in the... Because you had to finish that current tour. You had to finish that. Uh, then you went back home on a 30-day leave. Then I'd get to see... My kid was born in January. And i get to see my kid 30 days. Then I would come back to the 101st and I'd take a rifle platoon over as a second lieutenant. And uh, and I'd be commissioned as, uh, as, as a second lieutenant. And uh, that's, that's when I was in, back at Camp Eagle, you know, in the rear of the gear, you know. And then they came and got us at 4 o'clock in the morning to go on the hill. And I thought, man, <laughs> they're, they're secondary role, huh? <laughs> and that's what, so I get back home. I don't go back and take the commission. I, I drop out of the program. And three months later, my wife and kid leave me anyway. <laughs> So I'm back on my fourth tour, and I went back on my fourth tour in February '70, and then I got wounded again on November 6, '70, and that was, uh, well, I well I got last rites set over me there, and uh, twice, and uh, that was my last time in Vietnam. What unit were you with on your tour? I was with Third of the Seventeenth Air Cav. Now Third of the Seventeenth Air Cav is a helicopter outfit. And what I mean by that, their mission was what they call hunter-killer outfit. The hunter-killer is a cobra, you know what a loach is? Uh, no. Okay, it's a small observation type of helicopter. Yeah. And you, of course, you know what a cobra is. Well, the loaches go in at treetop level and they look for like enemy base camp. They're looking for stuff. They, they're really in harm's way there, really big time. And uh, the Cobra flies at a, anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 and back up. Well, behind the Cobra is a six-man team from the ARP platoon, which is the infantry platoon. ARPs mean aerial rifle platoon. And uh, I was the platoon leader of... I, well, I got back on my fourth time, and I realized I didn't want to be back in the Ashaw Valley with a 70-pound rucksack on my back. I didn't want to be at, back at Doc Toe again, or in Quantree, or the Quezon Valley, you know, or the Iodrang area. You know. I had quite enough of that, thank you very much. And uh, I, So the guy said, Sarge, he said, where, where do you want to go, Sarge? This is my fourth night in the 90th replacement. And I said, 
well, I know I'm infantry, but uh, I think I'd like something a little less odorous than my last three tours. <laughs> I'd like to keep away from the rucksack and the asha and all of this stuff. And is there any way I can kind of like, you know, have an easy infantry? <laughs> I said, is there anything like that exist? <laughs> they said, you know what? They said, 3rd of the 17th uh, uh, Air Cav in Benoit. Uh, uh, they need a, a, a platoon sergeant. Uh, they don't have officers as platoon leaders. All the officers are pilots there. So basically, you'd be in charge of the ARC platoon, and he explained to me what the ARC platoon is. And, I, and he says, they don't stay out overnight. They go out and do missions in the day, because their job to fly chase behind, behind the Cobra. Say the Cobra, a, a team goes down, gets shot down or something, we go in after them. Okay. They go in and they discover a, uh, 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 an, em an enemy bunker complex. Then I take the platoon and we go in and check it out. We don't know what's going to be in there, maybe nothing, maybe not. Uh, but that's basically our job. And, uh, but then at night, after operations are done for the day, you go back to Benoit, and as the platoon sergeant, I get my own little room, I could put a little, little refrigerator in there, have cold beer, Mama-san cleans my fatigues, cleans my boots for me. We just go out and do missions every day, and come back at night. So I don't have, you're not digging foxholes or anything like, I said, that's for me, send me there. <laughs> and it wasn't that far from Saigon, would you give me an excuse once in a while to go over to Saigon for a day or so, you know, and uh, have a little bit of adult activity. So I went there, and uh, and we actually we went into Cambodia in that May, because I went back in February of 70, then the Cambodian invasion, Nixon sent us to Cambodia in May of 70, we were there 33 days. So I went there, and then our troop, uh, you had, four, you had three troops in the squadron, because they it's 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 a, a, a helicopter, you know, they don't call battalions or companies, they call them squadrons, and instead of companies, they call them troops. And instead of like a captain, company, commander, you got a major who's the troop commander, and a full colonel, that's the squadron commander, not a lieutenant colonel, that's the difference. And so they sent our troop up to uh, uh, Quan, Quan Tri, which is way, way high north. And that's all heavy NVA up there. And uh, uh, we went in and uh, we had, with the platoon, we thought there was something. We're checking out, we thought a, bun a bunker complex. We're moving up a trail towards it. And uh, uh, my point man, I was walking slack behind the point man and uh, I heard I heard his weapon, he fired his weapon, and Sarge, Sarge. So I came up, and uh, there was a dead NVA, 18, 19 years old, fresh haircut. These are fresh troops. And then a blood trail going off in the brush, because he shot them both, but the other guy didn't die. And uh, they, they, you know what an OPLP is? Okay, they were on, they were on OP during the day. And that's what that was, you had a two-man two OP for a larger unit up the trail. I knew that, and we had a new lieutenant with us that he was just there to get his time. And he, he, you know, so he really wasn't in charge of the patrol, okay? But I was. But he, we had to get extracted, we needed, we needed to meet the choppers and get back and get out of there pretty soon. And uh, so I said, okay, he, he said, can we just go up another 50 meters? And then we'll break, I said, we're gonna have to break it off as I, I don't feel good about this trail. And I said, these two guys weren't out here having a jack-off contest. Okay, these guys are here for a reason. And we don't know where that blood trail leads. He could have very well made it back to the unit. We don't know. So, unfortunately, we went up, you know, maybe 30 yards. And, uh, an explosion. Some people say it was uh, a flamethrower. Some people say it was a booby trap. I have no idea. But it was a click and a poof. And I didn't, get, my point man was killed. He got hit direct. Um, but everything, it, November is a dry time in Vietnam. And everything was on fire. I caught fire. Everything. And I had grenades on me. And uh, my guys, a couple of my guys rolled me out. I wasn't good for anything. I was, my, you know, all my ears, 
My ears are all, all, it's all grafts. I got all grafts. I burned pretty bad. I was 52% burnt. Uh, about 14% third degree and the rest deep second. A deep second's worse than third degree because your nerve endings are still there. Yeah. And the uh, LT was killed and medevaced us back to the, to the hospital. I, <laughs> my, everybody has their own little nightmare about something happening to them when you're in the war. Mine was, you know, my happy patch. And I didn't want anything to happen to that. <laughs> Getting blown up there, having something happen down there. It, it was more terrifying than an AK-47 right between my eyes. This was my nightmare. And I thought, for sure, I'm, I'm freaking out. They're holding me because my ears were all black. And they're holding me because you can break your ears off. Okay. So they got a guy in there, it's a medevac. And he's holding my head so I won't thrash around tear my ears and uh, they get me out of the hospital and go my balls my balls I'm free <laughs> this captain nurse she and they bring me into the OR and she takes her hand boom right in my crotch sergeant can you hear me <laughs> everything is intact everything is there we're gonna go to sleep now can you count by, from 10 to backwards and then they put the thing on my face and I, I think I remember getting to nine. <laughs> Next thing I got waking up, I'm in traction. I got like three different IV. I got, I got a thing going my nose into my chest. I got IVs in my leg. I'm all, oh, I mean, I, I look like the mummy that just got worked over. Oh, I was in terrible. Oh my goodness. And uh, so, uh, and I, I was getting ready to go on R&R &R, and and i would never been there to Bangkok. The GIs named it Bring Your Cock because <laughs> Bangkok was a paradise. You know? Plus, my wife had already left me. So, Bangkok it is. And I, was, I only had like a week or so to go before I went to Bangkok. And I'm laying there and the CO came by. How are you doing, Sergeant Morgan? How are you? So, oh, just fine. And <laughs> I said, I guess I'm not going to go to Bangkok. <laughs> he says, that's the least of your worries. Uh, he said, you're going back to the United States. <laughs> you're, you're being medevac to the U.S. And I was. Yeah. Well, first to Japan. They had to stabilize me in Japan. And then they have a burn team that came out from uh, Fort, uh, well, Fort Sam Houston, uh, uh, Brook uh, Medical Center in San Antonio. I was medevac from Japan to Brook. It's uh, probably at that time probably the best burn unit in the United States. It was on it was on the cutting edge of burn units. Civilians were there. It was really renowned. It was the best burn, best burn center that it was at that time. And so I spent a couple of months there. And the rest of my army career after that, but that was my last. I was wounded November 6, 1970. And, uh, well, I passed, I died. Well, at least they thought I was going to die um, uh, uh, the morning of Thanksgiving, uh, 1970, in the hospital. See, burn wounds are funny. They're not like gunshot wounds. You can die a month later from them. And uh, my wife, who's a retired nurse, said it's because of your lot, lo your breathing and everything is affected because of your loss of your, the liquids in your body. I went down to 106 pounds. So yeah, I look like an escapee from Auschwitz. And uh, on that Thanksgiving morning in 1970, because, you know, I didn't, you didn't really sleep like you and I know sleep for that first two weeks I was there. It was like I was in a constant nightmare and I never got to sleep. And I never got to drink water either. All they did was give me Gatorade well, because of the electrolytes. I would have given my right arm to have a cold glass of water. The first two weeks I was in the burn unit, I got no water. I, I used to think about water all the time. No water. I couldn't, after that, I couldn't drink Gatorade for the next 15 years after that. Anyway, one night, and they had me on a circle bed. You know what a circle bed is? They got to flip you every four hours because it was burned on my back too. And uh, to heal. 
So yeah, I mean, and so I was on my on my belly like that, and they got liquid. You have your Gatorade and a big long straw. You're like the fly, you know. You know. Yeah. And uh, suddenly, it's like I don't remember going to sleep or anything, but suddenly I'm out of my body, and I'm looking at myself on the circle bed. I said, "Well, that's odd. Why is that?" The next thing, these these are just things I remember today still remember it. I feel, and I'm looking at my, because my hands were all I, like claws. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I'm walking and it felt like I was walking on water or something. Just what it felt like. And the next thing I know, I'm in contact with an entity, which I felt very good. I hadn't crossed the water all the way. The entity was on the other side and it wasn't talking like I'm talking, but I knew exactly what it was saying. And I remember it saying, are you ready to come home now? I don't remember answering. The next thing I remember, I feel like I'm in a, a, a tunnel. Um, and I know people are close. There's a sense of urgency. And I know people are close to me. But their voices sound like way long away. They're, they don't sound like they're close to me. And my head is to the left. I can't move a finger. I can't even bat an eye. And I'm just laying there and I'm listening. And the next thing I know, a set of hands is putting my head up. I want to say something because I don't want anybody touching my head, but that's impossible. The next thing I know, I wake up and it's morning again. I'm sitting there in the damn wheelchair in the morning. They had these old wooden wheelchairs, really uncomfortable. And the pain and everything is there. And I thought, wow, what a dream. Well, they had Ward 14, you had two wards for the burn unit, 14A and 14B. 14B was the critical ward, which I, it was first, my first two, three weeks was in 14B. And guy, when, ambulatory was when you went down to 14A. And uh, so I'm down in 14A. And uh, they had a program where the guys, you know, they get you in a wheelchair and take you up to 14B and you give the other guys that are really, having trouble like you were, uh, give them encouragement. Because we had a thing up in 14B, you know, called the uh, Chamber of Horrors. And every morning you got debrided. You knew your time too, and you could hear the screams in the hallway. All they gave you was Valium. They didn't give you pain meds. And they taken the dead skin off you. And you knew what time your time was. 7.45 was mine. And you could hear him screaming down the hall in the, in the room here in a tea tank with a little water in it. Yeah. Anyway, so it was my turn to go up and they took me up in the wheelchair. They brought me up and they had this E7, this, this, he was the ward master up there, this guy. I had two guys die in my, each unit had like three guys in it. One guy was came from Japan, Louis, he was a Chinese American kid. And he, he was able to walk, I, could, I had to be carried in the, in Japan, I, I couldn't walk. But Louis came up and sit on a chair by me once and tried to talk to me. I, could, I just thought it was me, but I didn't understand what he was saying. And he didn't look bad. He had his pajamas and stuff on. And he went with me, he was in my cubicle at Brook. He had gotten it inside and he, he died. And there was a kid when I got there named Marco. I didn't know who he was. He was already there when I got there, but he was in the bed next to me. And, and you could, his legs were really burned bad. I didn't see all of him. And he, somehow he start kicking the legs at night and shit. And about, I'm laying there on the circle bed one night and I looked and it's about two in the morning and they came in with a gurney and they, they put his body on the gurney and covered him with a sheet. And I still remember laying there looking and watching, watching him go down the hall. With the, with, I never met Marco. He was, he was out of it when I got there. But, but Louis, uh, I knew, and he died. So there's a reason I'm telling you that. So when I came up, the ward master saying, yeah, he said, shit. He said, yeah, you were in a bad luck cubicle. You know, we lost Louis and uh, Marco both. And I said, yeah, he says, we thought you were number three on Thanksgiving. I said, what? I didn't even know what he's talking about. He says, yeah, you, you, you stopped breathing. Yeah. I said, it was like early in the morning? He says, yeah. And then I told him about what happened, what I just told you. He said, well, I don't know about the, the walking on the water or anything like that, but the guy that was taking your head and putting it up was me. 
He said, that we're putting oxygen mask on you. I said, so that really happened? And he said, yeah. You don't remember that? And I said, yeah, I remember. I thought it was a dream. He said, that was no dream. And I said, so if that's not a dream, what about the other part? So I've been uh, a Christian ever since. <laughs> I got some real funny stories from the burn unit, too. It's funny as hell. <laughs> Those guys would crack me up. <laughs> and this one guy named Red, he, he, he was a door gunner or something. Got, but ears are the first to go up. That's why the rear tenor about your ear. My ears got burned, but they were able to keep them. I got, they're all grafted now. You can look and you can see all the grafts on them. But uh, Red lost both of his ears. And uh, he's, a, he's a joker. So we're down in the snack. He's waiting for the prosthesis. Yeah, prosthesis. Ears he was waiting on. Okay. Yeah, they're prosthesis. They're, yeah, you don't want to walk around with stubs, you know. So I'm in the snack bar, you know, and you got your line up here. Everybody's in their robes and bath, you know, pajamas. And I'm sitting with a couple of guys, and Red's in the line. And I'm, what the hell? I'm, well, well, the ears, they look like they're on backwards. <laughs> what the? I said, Red. Red, I said, come here, hey man. I said, I see you got your, your new ears. I said, I think you got them on backwards or something. He goes, shh, I don't want anybody to know. I don't let anybody, it's because I don't want anybody sneaking up on me. <laughs> I said, shrewd, shrewd. So that was Brooke. And anyway, um, then I was in the Army for 20 years, yeah. And it retired uh, November 1983.